Welcome to Build with DynamoDB. My name is Eden Zulich. I'm a DynamoDB specialist SA. And my name is Rick Houlihan. I'm a principal technologist for NoSQL for AWS. All right, today we're diving into a real world use case of data modeling where we have actually more complex relationships uh, than what we had last time when we did a fairly simple, straightforward schema uh, for, a, for a movie database. Mm -hmm. Also, um, we're, we have our moderators in the chat room who are ready to answer questions. And some of those questions, uh, they'll forward to us so that we can also answer them live. So please send us your questions. Don't be shy. And uh, I think we're ready to, sure. to roll, right? Oh, well, there we go. <coughs> All right, thanks, Aiden. So, uh, yeah, my name is Rick Lehan. I, I do a lot of NoSQL work at AWS. I'm sure uh, some of you who are watching the video have seen some of my sessions at uh, reInvent and whatnot. Um, so what we're here talking about today is actually data modeling in NoSQL, and this is, uh, and we're gonna just jump right into it. I know this is a series of, uh, of, of videos that we've done here to kind of dive into various use cases and whatnot, so I'm not gonna explain a lot about what we're talking about. This is the third or third now in the series, or fourth? This was, uh... Show number five. I Show believe. number five. Four All right, or five. there we five. go. So, yeah. uh, so go back in time and watch the other ones if you want to know a little bit more about what we're talking about. But this is uh, what we're going to talk about today is a service. It's called the Collection Rights Database Service. Uh, it's an internal service at uh, Amazon uh, that we use to. Uh, uh, help our Kindle customers understand what uh, collections and, and items within those collections they actually have rights to. Uh, so if you look at the service here, uh, it's very specific. Uh, 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 set of access patterns that we run against this as with all NoSQL databases when we understand the access patterns we have a better time uh, modeling the data and so this is a really good example of a service like that so what do they do with the uh, with the collection rights database again they track the user rights to objects and collections they want to authorize uh, the access to digital media and they support uh, the use the use of a recommendation engine right so when users go to check out uh, and they want to see what other items they might be interested in uh, we'll consult the collection rights database to see what items and collections users actually have. Uh, so this is what that entity model looks like uh, real shortly. In the lower left there, we have uh, customers, customers own collections. Uh, collections can be owned by many customers, obviously, and customers can own many collections. There's a many-to-many -many relationship between those uh, two entities. And then collections have items. Uh, so there's a one-to-many relationship between items, but uh, customers can also own items. They, they don't necessarily own the whole collection of items. They might own uh, just a few of the items in a particular collection. So uh, there's a many-to-many -many between customers and items, and there's a one-to-many between collections and items. So an interesting kind of hierarchical model there. <coughs> uh, if you look at the access patterns, they're pretty straightforward. For a given customer, we want to get all of the owned items for uh, a given collection. And then we want to get those items that are sorted in a couple of dimensions. Uh, one is by acquisition time. So when we customer goes to checkout, we want to know what was the most recently purchased item across all collections. So maybe when we do to fill out a recommendation, say, hey, you might also be interested in, uh, or you know, knowing that maybe they haven't visited or, or seen the collection since maybe new items were added right. or whatnot, right? Uh, and then the latest read time. So we can see not only when the customer actually uh, last acquired an item within that collection, but also when they last touched an item within that collection. So that's an interesting access pattern. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna wanna sort the customer's uh, 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 items and collections by latest read time. And then also uh, sorted by uh, the position of the items, right? So you mm -hmm. know, uh, and if you think of a, a collection of items, might be a series, and you might have volume one, volume two, volume three. So these items have, you know, positions also mm -hmm. as well. So they want to get these uh, collections sorted by position, and uh, then we want to also get all the owned collections for a given user in pages. So it's interesting we look across our user base because some users have. You know, potentially thousands of collections, right? We have like, uh, you know, companies that, or libraries, for example, that have a library account that might have, you know, large numbers of collections and other other uh, customers that have a very small number of collections. And again, we want those collections sorted by acquisition time and by read time. So mm -hmm. we want to know which, uh, which, which ac uh, collections customers have been reading when, and when they most recently read those collections, right? Right, right. So, um, and again, obviously, we're dealing with relationships, and uh, I was just kind of curious, what was the main reason why they decided to go with DynamoDB for this? Oh yeah, so again, the, this was a, this is what we call a tier one service inside of Amazon, and 
Uh, Amazon uh, had a, a project recently to migrate all of our relational workloads to NoSQL technologies. And <clears throat> our tier one services are the ones that are actually revenue generators, right? So when a, when a service is making money for Amazon, we, we classify that service as a tier one service. We have 350 some odd tier one services and every one of those services was mandated to migrate to NoSQL technologies for many reasons, uh, mostly because of scale. Right, uh, right. And if you think about the Kindle service is one of our Fairly uh, well scaled out services. This is, a, a, this is an example of one of these services yeah. that was starting to push the edge of the limits of what a relational database could provide. Mm -hmm. So uh, we ended up uh, looking at the primary driver for this was scale. Yeah, yeah. So it really goes back to, to the original reasons why we have NoSQL's databases. I mean, internet scale. And what we mean by internet scale is just not, not just the number of users, but it's also uh, potentially number of concurrent connections, number of concurrent oh, users, yeah. and, and, and velocity so on. of access, right? And velocity I mean, uh, of access, yeah, right? Yeah, and that's really what we get into when we talk about these access patterns. What we're talking about now is the shape of these patterns, mm -hmm. but when we get into actually looking at how we're going to model the data, what we want to think about is the velocity of those patterns, right? right? How frequently are these patterns being executed, and how fast is the data being requested? Because mm -hmm. that makes a big difference when we start to model, you know, how do we yeah. model the data? Yeah, and and and. It, yeah, from everything that I see all the time, it, it comes down to a couple of things in addition to scale, right? I mean, it's performance of scale, mm -hmm. and then the cost has right. to scale oh, as well, right? <laughs> right, and this so. is the key, right? So it's, uh, when I talk about why no SQL, right, it's, uh, it's really why have we ever evolved our database technologies? Mm -hmm. Because at some point we get into a situation where the data pressure on the system, and this is the ability of the system to process the amount of data that's being asked to process at a reasonable cost or within a reasonable time. When one of those dimensions is broken, we need to invent something, and we invented NoSQL right. technology because the relational databases were failing us at right. scale. Right, absolutely. So, um, last two patterns to talk about here uh, basically, for a given collection, we want to get all the customers for a given collection. For a given item, we want to get all the customers for a given item. And it's important to look at those patterns because those are the ones where. The, the number of customers that own a collection can be extremely large. Mm -hmm. And the number of customers that own an item within a collection can also be very, very large. So these are the ones where we have to start worrying about scale. We were just talking about scale and why do we choose NoSQL. Uh, you know, when we start talking about modeling the data, we took a look at the size of the data, the velocity of the data, the shape of the data, and those queries right there are probably the ones that are gonna bring the largest result sets back. And so it's interesting when you look at those queries because we have to actually account for them specifically and we'll look at that when we get into the actual schema. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the schema for this table and it looks like a whole lot at the beginning but again if you've been following the series you know that we like to build things as single tables we like to put multiple types of items on the same table we like to build partitions that are representative of the entities in our in our relationship model <clears throat> and we like to fill those partitions with items that kind of denote the one to many and the many to many relationships here and we've got plenty of those right so yeah, yeah. let's talk about <clears throat> what kind of partitions we've created here so the first partition we have uh, is our uh, customer partition. Within the customer partition, we have a couple items. We have collection items and we have item uh, records, collection mm -hmm. records and item records. And collection records obviously describe top level collections. So whenever a user acquires an item, an item belongs to a collection, they're gonna get two items within their partition. One is gonna be the item that's the item record and the other is gonna be the item that is the collection record. Right? Yeah, and, and, and also what, what we're doing here is really we're saying we're, uh, how, how we're modeling this is we have a partition for each entity. Right, well, we have a partition for each entity, we have a partition for each uh, uh, customer. Right? right, right. And inside of these customer partitions, we're connecting the collections and the items using these mm -hmm. edges, right? So this is a classic, what we call adjacency list, right? Right, right. Uh, <clears throat> so and those, are re those represent relationships. Those represent relationships. So every right. customer on this table could have a, a copy or an item that indicates that he owns a, a particular collection mm -hmm. or a particular or an item within that collection, right? right. So again, our access patterns were get me all the uh, uh, items the customer owns. In this particular case, starts with IR, which is the item record prefix that we determined for this particular table. Uh, and customer ID equals X, uh, sort key starts with IR, gives me all the items the customer owns. That was one of our access patterns. Uh, get me all the collections, similarly, give me the, uh, it starts with the CR on the sort key, brings back all the collection items. And then what we're gonna start doing is indexing these items. Because the other items on the table, we're never really selecting the collection item. We're never really selecting the item mm -hmm. item, right? We're selecting right. who owns the collection, who mm -hmm. owns the items, right? Those were the access patterns. Patterns. So we don't really care about those those particular individual items, uh, but we do need them because we're going to be indexing 
you know, uh, to, to, you know, group the customers by those particular partitions. Mm -hmm. So here's how that actually breaks out. If you look at the first two GSIs, GSI 1, GSI 2, they're going to share the same partition key, and they're going to share the same partition key as the table. So these could actually be LSIs. They don't have to be GSIs. I use GSIs in this particular case because they're flexible. Mm -hmm. We can create them and delete them at any time if these access patterns change. Uh, LSIs are more rigid, right? They're created when the table's created. They can never be removed. Mm -hmm. you know? So this particular case, it wasn't uh, strong consistency. It was a big issue for us because the data is not really all that highly mutable. And so we said, okay, we'll use GSIs. And the first GSI is going to be sorted by, um, and I'm sorry, but the, on my screen, that's even a little small for me with glasses, but is that acquisition time that we're looking at there? In that particular mm -hmm. one, yep. Okay, and and then so on the on the next GSI GSI two would be our would be our read time sort. So GSI one sorted by acquisition time, GSI two sorted by read time, and every time we go and touch an item or a customer opens up their Kindle and reads a particular book, mm -hmm. you know, then what we're going to do is update the the read time for the book right. and the read time for the collection that the book belongs mm -hmm. to. Right. So both of those queries will return the appropriate right, items. Right. And uh, just a quick, some, somebody's uh, danger X, danger X, or this is Roman uh, 13, danger 13, user is asking what does IR and CR stand for, maybe. Uh, okay, sure. So these were, so when we start to build the keys, and let's go back real quick to look at those. Uh, when we build these sort keys, what we're really doing is using those prefixes to determine what type of item is this. So we'll see mm -hmm. this a lot when we create item hierarchies within partitions. Sometimes the IDs of the items are not necessarily informative. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really tell me what the item is. In our particular use case, we say, get me all the collections for a given customer. Right. So if I use a prefix for a collection record, which is CR, then when I say my sort key condition starts with CR, then it's going to bring back all collection records. Right, right. right? If I use a sort key that starts with IR, then that's mm -hmm. going to bring back all item records. Item records. So CR is a collection record, IR is an item record, and these are just simply uh, alphanumeric prefixes that we determined with the customer would mean this mm -hmm. type of item, that type of item. In other words, if you're modeling your own database, you come up with your own convention, Sure. what makes sense, and also, uh, well, in terms of what kind of name you want to select, but also uh, prefixing scheme to set up a hierarchy. That's, That's correct. how you set up a hierarchy using this prefixing scheme. That's correct. Of your and own so we'll choosing. use this in many ways. Like an example could be an event collection by customer or by device, and those events might have different states. Then state could be part of the prefix. I could have an info warning critical, mm -hmm. and then maybe my sort key could be state and date. I could right, say, give right. me all the uh, critical events in the last 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I could say, you know, that is between critical dash, you know, 24 hours ago and critical dash now. Right, That gives right. me a sort key condition that's date sortable and it's faceted. And, right. and also to confirm, uh, Danger13 is asking again, and this is a JSONC list pattern. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so what, what we're talking about here is adjacent to list. Yeah, pattern. these items are actually mm -hmm. designated. There's a connection to the, you know, when a, when a customer buys an item or, or, or establishes ownership of part of a collection, then there will be an item created within their partition that describes how that connection, right. or what, you know, what that connection is. Mm -hmm. When was the last read time? When was the acquisition time of the item? When was the last read time? When was the last acquisition time of the collection? Right. right? Those are all edges. Those are properties of the edge, yeah. right? How is the yeah, customer yeah. related to the collection? How is the customer related to the item? Exactly. Right? So yeah. one, one way that, that I use to distinguish what's the entity specific, obviously there, there, there's data here about each entity, for example, customer, that does not involve any other entities. Sure. And that's, and that's entity specific. But once you have data um, in, in a record that, that in fact references, that says something about another entity, mm -hmm. and in this case, it'll in fact reference somehow a different entity, that's a relationship, and that's the edge in the... That is the, the edge in this case, right? A relationship is really an edge that connects yeah. two partitions, two nodes on the graph in some way. And mm -hmm. so if you look at the different types of nodes that we have created or different types of partitions, we have a customer partition, we have collection partitions, we have item partitions. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is connecting these things in various ways. Uh, and we'll start to see how these mm -hmm. aggregates are performed or are created when we look at these GSIs, right? So in the, in the case of... You know, customer-centric data, we're looking for collections sorted by acquisition time, mm -hmm. collections sorted by read time. Those are just simply resorting the data within the customer's partition, basically mm -hmm. resorting the edges or the relationships that the customer has to right. these items and collections, right, by dates. Mm -hmm. uh, 
as we get into the rest of these GSIs, right, we look at GSI 3. Uh, <clears throat> GSI 3, what we're doing is starting to look at, get me all the collections, all the, all the customers that own a collection. Mm -hmm. Now I'm starting to query across the partitions, right? I'm starting to look at the other side of that many to many, right? Mm -hmm. There's a many to many between customers and collections. How many, many customers can own a collection and many customers can own the collection. So now I need to query the other side of that, mm -hmm. uh, of, of that relationship. And so the way we're gonna do that is by uh, <laughs> partitioning on a uh, right sharded key, right? Because we have many, many customers, millions of customers. And so as customers start to, um, you know, uh, acquire these uh, these these items within these collections. It's going to build very very large partitions. And so when we want to query that data, mm -hmm. uh, since DynamoDB has a partition level throughput of 1,000 WCUs or 3,000 RCUs, mm -hmm. as the number of collections and the number of customers who own those collections increase, I'm going to have to add additional logical storage partitions to be able right. to increase the throughput of that workload. <laughs> and so every time a customer buys an item, this is what we're going to end up doing: is we're going to go in there, we're going to say uh, on that right sharded key we're going to add a partition between zero to n depending on the size of the collection mm -hmm. so every single you know uh, uh, some collections are more popular than others some <laughs> items are much more popular than others so every right, single collection right. every single item gets that first partition that zero partition mm -hmm. and as we start to as we query the zero partition inside of there there's going to be a little item on this and you can see number partitions if you look at those items down below where it says collection item or item items there's a number of partitions attribute. It tells you how many additional partitions there are. Right. The interesting thing about that is this really kind of uh, uh, goes back to how important it is to know your data. That's correct. Basically. Right. This is the velocity part, mm -hmm. right? This is where we're saying how much data. How, what is the volume of the data? Right. What's the fr high, how, 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 how high velocity are the queries? What's the frequency of the mm -hmm. query? And this tells us essentially how many partitions do we need to add if right. maybe a hundred thousand customers own a single collection then that's not too many but mm -hmm. if, if if a million own the same collection then maybe that is too many sure so now we'll look at the size of the item uh, then the the the, uh, the nature of the query right mm -hmm. does the query want to return all that data as fast as possible does the query is the query okay to paginate through the data right. uh, can we rate limit the data uh, so this is uh, one of the things when you get into no SQL data modeling is extremely important is to understand understand uh, the velocity and the shape and the frequency of your access mm -hmm. patterns. And, and we talk about right sharding. Um, also, we, we, if you watched one of the previous episodes, we, we went over that pattern. But it's also in the documentation if you go to uh, the, the section about best practices in DynamoDB documentation, you'll find um, more information Absolutely. about right sharding. <laughs> and also what the limitations are around uh, partitions, um, you know, as 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 you know already, right? Um, each partition can only support so much, uh, both in terms of data volume mm -hmm. and reads and writes. And so, for writes, we talk about uh, partition limits of one thousand write capacity units per partition, correct? And also three thousand um, read capacity units yeah. per partition. Exactly. And this is why we sometimes need to um, introduce write sharding when we know that these limits uh, will, will get exceeded. And exactly. that was the case in this particular... In this particular query, because yeah. when they wanted to go get all of the uh, users that owned a given item or all of the users that owned a given collection, they needed to return that data as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, there was a, a need to be able to potentially scan in parallel more than one partition because if millions of customers own the same collection mm -hmm. then they couldn't they would have to paginate through the data it would take multiple seconds to return the data right mm -hmm. right and and by the way when you are querying you can see what the consumed read capacity is and you can use that to to essentially um, limit the rate at which you're that's retrieving correct. and, and that's, that's a good point I mean oftentimes people ask me how do I rate limit my processes uh, if you turn on the return consumed capacity in your mm -hmm. drivers, you can keep a, a, a running total of, of the last second's worth of consumed capacity just mm -hmm. by maintaining a counter in the application. Right. Uh, and then that way you can kind of know when to pause or so to speak or, or rate limit yourself. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I'll do that with certain processes, absolutely. All right, so this uh, there's there's the the third GSI and then the fourth GSI again is going to be sorted the, sorting the items a customer owns within a collection by position. So again, we're going to go to uh, uh, the customer key and collection ID and then sorting in individual items by position because we want to get those customer items by collection by position. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's take a look at what those indexes actually look like when we go to query those things. Again, if we go to our uh, first GSI 1 and 2, there's the acquisition time and the read time indexes. 
Uh, same partition key as a table querying by customer key. Uh, we can start with CR gives us the uh, collection records by acquisition time. So the key, the, the query here is actually a limit query where they're going to say, give me the most recently accessed collection. They don't care about the actual sorted order of collections. They want to know what was the one you most recently touched, right? So it say starts with CR, limit one. Limit it one. It comes back with this, just the top, you know, the one that most recently touched. Same things with items uh, within a collection, starts with collection key, uh, you know, limit one, right? Mm -hmm. And that gives me the item within a collection, right? Uh, and then uh, same thing for read time. When was last time you read something within the collection? Mm -hmm. When was last time you read an item? We'll use those same keys, uh, key queries here to return those. Uh, moving on to our GSI 3 and 4, which is our collection and position indexes, items by collection, and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, this is where we, that GSI 3 is our right chart of GSI. So when I want to get all of the customers who own a given collection, the first thing I'm going to do is query collection key pipe 0, which is the 0 partition. Everything has a 0 partition. And what's going to come back from that is interesting because we're going to get not only all of the, the customers that own those collections, their latest acquisition time, latest read mm -hmm. time in those collections, but we're also going to get the collection item, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what exists in the zero partition. Right. And that collection item is going to have that little attribute in there. It's going to say how many additional mm -hmm. items do we do we expect so to see? It's essentially just metadata. That, right. That it's you, metadata. That describes mm -hmm. the collection and mm -hmm. describes the the mm -hmm. number of partitions that are required to hold this aggregated data. Right. right. And so I'll read that zero partition, and it'll come back with that first item. The first item I process will tell me how many additional partitions. Mm -hmm. So at the application layer, they'll get that item, and they'll say, Oh, let me spin off an additional two, three, four processes, depending on how many. If it's one of our more popular collections, they, they might have actually spread out those users across you know, a, right. a, 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 a larger number of collections, right? right. Uh, <clears throat> or a larger number of partitions. Same thing goes with items. If, uh, if, I, if, I, if an item within a collection is extremely popular, we're gonna have to shard that item out across multiple partitions, but every item will have that initial partition, the zero partition, mm -hmm. which contains the metadata item, which informs right. the application how many additional partitions to read. So that's kind of how the data lays out on the on that GSI, and then GSI four again, very straightforward um, by collection by position uh, for a given customer, right? So customer key, collection key is our partition key, and then the sort key is the uh, partition of the given item. Mm -hmm. uh, so these query out fairly straightforward. Uh, on the one we just described, the right sharded partition always query the zero partition and follow up with the additional partitions if necessary. Mm -hmm. Same thing for items. And, and then the attributes that we have, um, in, in fact, in these GSIs are, are essentially attributes that we need to have for the given view right. of, of the application. Right. Yeah, if some of these, uh, and these items are actually partial views. This schema is partial views. There's extended attributes on all these mm -hmm. items that are irrelevant to the query, so I'm not showing those in this actual schema. Right, these right. items are a little larger than what we're seeing here. Uh, not much, but there's you know, a good half a dozen other attributes that exist on mm -hmm. all these items that's, that are really irrelevant to our Yeah, search. The, the really cool thing about uh, Dynamo's G, Dynamo DB's GSI's global secondary indexes is that you can tailor those views um, to, to projections for, for your GSIs mm -hmm. to match the view that you really need for your application. Correct. And each view though, each projection or each GSI, I should say, also will always have the primary key from the table of projected. Yes. And so sometimes you need that. Right, yeah, sometimes you need that, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and you can choose to project some or all of the attributes from your other uh, from the primary table into the GSI. So it's a good point because sometimes the items that you're storing on the table are relatively large, mm -hmm. but the access pattern that I need to go look up against doesn't need all of the data in that item. Right. And so it's sometimes often, it, it's much more cost efficient to, uh, to project only some of the attributes onto the GSI because when I actually go to query that GSI, that pattern only needs this subset of attributes mm -hmm. and maybe there's you know 100 kilobytes of data that I'm leaving on the table. That's WCU right. cost, that's RCU cost, that's storage cost, and that's doubling all that cost mm -hmm. if, I, if I project everything to the GSI. Whereas if I maybe carve out the big data and leave that sitting on the table, mm -hmm. then the, what sits on the index is a subset of that data. It's gonna cost me less to store, it's gonna cost me less to query. It's right. be a, again, it's all so important to understand the access patterns in detail. Mm -hmm. When you're when you're designing your NoSQL schema uh, right. for all these reasons, yeah. and 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 I think my rule of thumb is usually if it's a read-heavy, read-oriented use case, you will benefit from a from a GSI that's tailored for for those reads, right? Um, and and then your queries really just uh, use that GSI. That's uh, right. The, the idea is you you use a single materialized mm -hmm. view, whether it's a table or a GSI, 
to get your data back. That's right. Your access pattern knows what index it needs to query to get the data. Right. And you're structuring the indexes to support those secondary access patterns. That's how NoSQL works. It's actually, uh, you know, it works most efficiently uh, when, when, the, when, the, when the developer decides which table, which index to query. Absolutely. Right. All right. So uh, let's get back to the, uh, the mapping of our data and our access patterns to our query. Uh, patterns here. This is what we end up with at the end of every phase. So if you kind of, if you're, those of you who have been watching our series here, understand that we have a pretty straightforward process to how we develop NoSQL applications, right? We're going to, you know, we're going to uh, uh, define the entity relationship model. We're going to identify the access patterns. We're going to characterize those patterns. Then we're going to denormalize the, the model to, mm -hmm. to support those access patterns. And in the end, what we're going to do is line up the queries to each individual pattern. So this is what we've done. We had, you know, we described our entity relationship model. We gave you a table of access patterns. We're going to extend the table and tell you, okay, now which table or GSI are we going to query to support this pattern? Uh, which sort key conditions uh, or which partition or primary key uh, conditions between the partition key and the sort key? If there's any extended filter card conditions in this particular use case, there were no filter conditions. Had many use cases where we end up applying filter conditions. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think in our next example that I'm going to be here for, we'll talk a little bit about that, right? Mm -hmm. when, when filter conditions are just as effective as selective uh, uh, indexes and why filter conditions can save you a lot of money even though the reads can be fatter so but in this particular case what we have is uh, a collection of our access patterns for a given customer get me all the collections sorted on these dimensions uh, given, given all the owned items sorted on these dimensions and then again for a given collection all the customers give me a, for a given item all the customers and that's the on the right two columns those are the tables and the, and the query conditions that we're going to execute to satisfy each one of those queries. And this is how we know in the end that we have addressed every single one of the access patterns. And, and if you want to know where do you get the access patterns, these access patterns are really, uh, they, they're distilled from the user stories, which, which make up the requirements of your application, right? right so right. And each one of your user stories is going to tell you how, how you're going to be accessing the data. Each one of those things defines the access patterns against the data. I can go through every one of the user stories that we've accepted for a given, uh, you know, sprint, a given, uh, you know, version of the product, and and define this exact table mm -hmm. to show the team exactly how they're going to be using their data. It's an extremely effective uh, process and a good tool to do that. Right. All right. And and in this case, we we have three uh, distinct GSIs. Correct. And four. these days, four. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, this particular four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so. Um, yeah, it used to be that you could only have five. Right. Um, now that limit has been raised to 20 for, right. yeah, for yeah, a single yeah, sure, table. Sure. So you can really go uh, beyond uh, just a few GSIs and keep creating new materialized views. Right. Because maybe new requirements. That may be, that's also true. Uh, but if you look come. at the schema, we actually overloaded these GSIs. And I was, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. So like GSI yeah. 3 is used for multiple access patterns. Right. right. Uh, GSIs 1 and 2 are used for single, uh, for multiple access patterns as well. Because again, both the collection and the items mm -hmm. are being indexed uh, by acquisition time and by read time. Right, right. right. And, they're, and we're reusing the acquisition time GSI and the read time GSI for both collections collections and items. Right. So there's two overloaded patterns on each one of those. If we were to index those ind individually, that would be four GSIs instead of two. Right. Same thing for this GSI three, that could be another two GSIs. Mm -hmm. So if we had, if we had, instead of using GSI overloading, mm -hmm. right, and if we had just gone ahead and indexed the actual fully named attributes that are associated to collections and, and, and whatnot, right. and items, we would end up with uh, seven GSIs on this yeah. project. So we reduced GSIs by three using overloading. Right, so, right. And, and that's really the, the one, one of the advantages of flexible schema with, with no SQL. Um, and, and you know what's funny, when, when we talk with people who are used to relational databases and strict yeah. you know, enforcement schema and so, so <clears throat> on, uh, you know, for them it's unusual and almost seems kind of hacky right. to be using these conventions that are all, but that's really the, the, the nature of no SQL. It's right. the flexibility that you get. And, and it really allows you to um, control different access patterns in your application Correct. rather than in the database itself. Right, That's well, it's a, it's a thing to understand is that, uh, you know, with, with relational databases, we're used to tables that have homogenous, you know, collections of items. Uh, and we're going to use an ad hoc query engine uh, to join the data to produce the views. Right. With NoSQL, what we're doing is we're creating collections that have a heterogeneous uh, you know, a set of items, and then we're going to use indexes to group those items mm -hmm. and produce the joins 
that we right. would have produced with the relational database. So it's actually, uh, 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 the mechanism is actually much more simple from a querying perspective because now, instead of having to have join queries, which cost me a lot of CPU, all I need are filter queries, filter expressions, select star from where X equals. This right. is a, anybody who, who works with relational databases is gonna tell you, wow, that's a much simpler query than even joining two tables. Mm -hmm. right, so this is why no SQL databases scale uh, beyond the, the, the level of relational databases, but it's also one of the reasons why they don't support those uh, ad hoc queries and mm -hmm. unknown access patterns. So it's important to understand the workload. In this particular use case, what we just described is a very transactional workload, right? Mm -hmm. It's an OLTP application. These right. access patterns will not change, uh, and they're always going to execute the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So we can build a data structure that services that. But if somebody comes along tomorrow and says, hey, you know, I got a, I got a totally new pattern against this data, and I don't want to do those patterns anymore, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden we're broken, right? right. right. <laughs> so it's important to understand the nature of your application, the nature of the access patterns, and in detail. Mm -hmm. Now, one last thing. <laughs> To talk about with this schema, as we just talked about, we had uh, you know we got four GSIs. We're sorting on uh, multiple dimensions. So how could it possibly be better than what we just did, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I just I just showed you with overloading, we went from seven GSIs to to four, uh, and so how might we be able to do this better? And and this this is something we actually as we went through this iterative process. This is the other thing we talk about when you're developing a NoSQL uh, data model. It's not a you know. Uh, uh, lowest common denominator and we're done, it's an iterative process. Right. And so one of the things we did to optimize this model in discussion was to come back and say, hey, look, uh, the primary table was using a full, you know, the composite key for items on the primary table was using the item ID. Mm -hmm. And we had a use case that says, get me items sorted by position. Well, position right. is unique within a collection, so I don't necessarily need to use item ID to define uniqueness. I can actually mm -hmm. use position. position. So when we define the item that is owned, when we add when it, when a customer buys the item and establishes the edge that connects them to the item, mm -hmm. instead of using the item ID in the sort key, I use the item's position, item's position. and that eliminates GSI four. Because now when I say select star from table where customer ID equals X starts with IR, mm -hmm. guess what? All the items come back in sorted order by collection. Right. Right. And that's that's another thing about sort keys, right? I'll right. always uh, basically give you the ability to to uh, group your data the way the way you want, the, right. the way you exactly want. That's exactly yeah. right. And mm -hmm. in this particular case, we, you know, we went now we went from four GSIs to three GSIs. Mm -hmm. That's huge because again, less WCU, less uh, storage cost, right? I mean, the RCUs are the same because we're hitting the data from the table instead of the GSI. But right. I don't have to do, the, I don't have to replicate the data and pay for twice yeah. the storage and twice the WCU. And, and while this might not matter early on in 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 your basically application or business when you're not scaled out, once you start scaling out. These all these things add up. Oh, at they scale. do. Oh, so. and, and tremendously so, right? I right. mean, this is these can be enormous costs. I mean, if you think about it, if I have a table provisioned at 100,000 WCUs, uh, and and I put a GSI up on that table, and you know, 90% of those items, or even 100% of those items, translate to the GSI. What have right. I done? Now I need a GSI at 100,000 WCUs. Mm -hmm. That's a big GSI. That's a lot of workload. If I can sat use the same table to satisfy multiple access patterns, in this case get me all the items a customer owns and get me right. all the items a customer owns sorted by position, use the same data on the same table, I've mm -hmm. halved the WCU cost and halved the storage cost. And, and in fact, that kind of um, really touches on, on a question from the user Kay Falk, who says, I'm trying to understand the value of single table design now that transactions are available. In my own design, single table design um, helps me get parent and children in one query, but I might as well make a simultaneous get item for the parent and query for the children. So is it actually just as efficient to just use a separate table for each entity? Am I missing something? Well, so there, there, you just you just answered your own question because you say you know I'd have, isn't it be, it wouldn't it be just as efficient to make two queries instead of one? Mm -hmm. No. Right. <laughs> right. It's not. It's actually twice mm -hmm. as efficient to use right. one query, right? So mm -hmm. uh, this is the key to single table designs, right? We want to want query for the hierarchy of items. We want to query for the collections of items. I'll make one round trip to the database. If I start to spread the data out across multiple tables, I have to make multiple queries. And oftentimes when I make those multiple queries, they cannot even be done in parallel. So although I might be able to say, get me all the orders for a customer in parallel, it would be very difficult to say, get me all the orders for a customer, all the items on those orders, all the invoices for those orders, and all the bills that were right. ever paid all in one query. 
right? You right. would never be able to do that. You would have to get the orders and the customers. You could do that in parallel. Then I would iterate through the, the orders result set and query the uh, order items table for every single order. Mm -hmm. uh, then I would have to query the bills table for every single bill. The, you know, for every, exactly. You know, and so on and so forth, right? So, yeah, and, and, and these queries quickly go from, from basically doing a single query for the entire data set, including relationships and everything, to N squared. Yeah, to dozens. Or dozens, dozens especially basically. Especially as you drill down through a complex hierarchy, right? Exactly. I mean, if, it's one thing if you have just a one single, simple parent-child, but what if I have parent-child to child to child, or I have many to many, or I have, you know, again, it just becomes... Uh, a nightmare of trying to, to manage, you know, the explosion of queries that you're going to have to execute. Uh, right. Bottom line, normalized data models belong in a relational database context where I have an ad hoc query engine that is capable of doing joins. If you right. cannot do joins efficiently, then you should not be, you know, modeling your data in a normalized manner. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's just the fundamental right. principle of NoSQL. Yep. Danger13 uh, <coughs> says, aren't indexes basically pre-calculated joins? Yes, that's yes, exactly that's, what we said. Indexes yeah. are how we produce joins in NoSQL. That's a very mm -hmm. astute observation. Right. This is what we do. We create a table with heterogeneous results. Uh, those mm -hmm. those the, or heterogeneous items. Those items share attributes. Those at, those indexed attributes share values, and that's how we're going to join those items together to satisfy. Our, and you can almost look at the table as your first index. I was right? going to say it's that it's an yeah. inverted index, right? Yeah, we yeah. create partitions and we load items into those partitions. Where right. they share, they share a partition key attribute that equals X. Right? Exactly. So that's, that, that is the first index in the. In if the, in if the you're index. looking at a many to many relationship, one side of that relationship, one view, materialized view, is represented provided by the table itself. And the other one by yes. the by the GSI, right? So. And and you can almost see, and, and this is why and fundamentally, this is why uh, the, you know when people start talking about the differences between a document store and a, and a wide column store, mm -hmm. uh, it tells me that they really don't understand NoSQL very well because uh, a document store is an indexed partition key only table, mm -hmm. and they they are the same. Right. Uh, you know, by default, the document store supports a key value access pattern, mm -hmm. which is the document ID. Get me that. And if I want anything else, I add indexes. Yeah. And a partition key table does the exact same thing. Get me the get me thing. Get me the item that has a partition key of X. Right, the only right. difference between a wide column and a document store is that the wide column store allows you to create a sort key on the table, which turns the table into the first inverted index. And in a document store, I actually have to define mm -hmm. a, an inverted index on the document collection. Right, right. But there, other than that, there's no difference between the two, and the data models are exactly yeah. the same. And at their core, they're they're essentially what we call, if you will, in a, in a theory of NoSQL databases, they're both key value That's correct. databases. Uh, they are. They right. are. Absolutely. And, and what distinguishes them is just different APIs. That's correct. One focuses on, on basically document uh, access patterns, and, and the other one basically mm. really focuses on, on kind of column-based. Well, I would almost or, say or, that the APIs are irrelevant, you know, that, those, that there is no such thing as a document access pattern or a wide column access pattern. That's just the data structure that holds the data. Yeah, yeah, but the, but, but, the, but, the, but the, the actual query access API pattern, that you, well, the query yeah, API, right. you know, granted, there's differences in the query API and the functionality of the query APIs and all this, right. uh, regardless. But there's a uh, there's certainly a, a, a the fundamental data modeling between the two, you know, document store, wide column store, they are exactly the same, and right. I will model the data exactly the same, and, right, the same, and I'll right. use exactly the same tenants, and we'll use exactly the same process and procedures, right. and in the end, the shape of the data will be exactly the same. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So for cool. more information, uh, we've got obviously online, we have some good stuff for you. The DynamoDB design patterns, best practices. That's part of our documentation. Uh, definitely uh, recommend anyone go search for that. It, we just, we, we describe in detail all these patterns we talked about, right? Right sharding, GSI overloading, uh, vertical partitioning, you know, all the things we just mentioned in this discussion today are described in detail on the uh, online there and the best practices. And then of course, there's the uh, session I did last, uh, reInvent last November on advanced design patterns for DynamoDB. We talk a lot about how we break down this entity relationship model and take that data and move it into uh, a shape and a structure uh, that, 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 that represents the relationships that you need to support your application's access patterns because, again, all the data is relational. Just because it's a NoSQL database doesn't mean we don't have any relational data here. Uh, if it wasn't relational data, we wouldn't care about it. So, um, and that's what I've got for you. If there's anything else, fire away. We've got some time here. If anyone has any additional questions, and uh, other than that, we'll go from there. Right. Okay. And I'm just checking the uh, um, chat room here. Let's see, uh, real quick. All right. Could you please discuss some strategies for write heavy items? Sure. Yeah, that's a really good question, as a matter of fact, is when mm -hmm. to, you know, it's like when do you optimize for the read versus the write? And this question <clears throat> came from 
Rack sack flop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right sharding is really the um, uh, the strategy of choice for for high high velocity right workloads, right? So uh, and then again, they but they, they I'm not sure. If there's a question He's, really about high velocity, or is it about right heavy? He has he has actually a, a concrete example. Okay. For instance, a post that receives a high volume of upvotes in a short period of time, the read pattern requires us to show the current number of upvotes. Key scattering is often recommended. However, do I initialize every single item scattered across uh, yes. multiple items? Okay. Should I scale the number of items dynamically? Keep in mind, this is under load. Imagine a popular Reddit post. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we actually have this problem. Uh, we need to track in variety scenarios with you know product uh, product down, uh, downloads for uh, Kindle and, and Amazon Music, whatnot. Um, likes or likes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so uh, typically, what we're dealing here is a situation where you have a high velocity counter. Uh, the value of the counter instantaneously and the accuracy of that counter is irrelevant because it's changing at a high frequency. So really what we want to do is capture a, uh, a read of the counter that is relatively that is relative to the state at the time that the query was made. Okay? Right, right. And so what we're doing here is uh, I've got some high velocity write pattern on the table every time some uh, uh, an update comes in or a, a response comes in on a post or a thread, uh, we're going to go ahead and use write sharding on the table to distribute those posts and those around the around a set of partitions to support the workload. Uh, in these cases, understand that you're going to get a thousand writes per second. Most of these posts are going to be probably under a kilobyte, and even the busiest of busy threads is, is unlikely to start exceeding much more than a thousand or two thousand posts a second. So we're going to be distributing these writes across a small number of partitions. But the problem is that counter, right? That mm -hmm. counter is going to be taking an update for every single time a post gets made, right. right? So how do we maintain the counter? So the way to do this is actually by leveraging Lambda, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to put a Lambda function out there as these posts come stream. in and the stream. We're going to read the data off the stream. And then this Lambda function is going to maintain some internal counters. And then they're just going to dump that. It's going to dump that counter out to the table, mm -hmm. you know, on, a, on a, like every five seconds or so, just to de decrease the key pressure on the counter metadata. Item, mm -hmm. right? So this is what we do with uh, Amazon Music. Mm -hmm. When Amazon Music, you know, songs are being downloaded, or you know, when they're when popular songs start getting downloaded a lot, we're not hitting the counter every single time. We've got mm -hmm. a Lambda function in the background that's kind of caching right. those downloads and pushing up to the to the table. And it's a distributed counter. That's right. Really? It's a distributed counter. This is what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. So as the Lambda functions are firing, they're firing across shards on the table. Mm -hmm. So they're not all one function processing all items. Right. It's many functions processing all these items. So all they're doing is saying, hey, since the last time I dumped, uh, I've counted 100 downloads. Mm -hmm. Let me go update the counter plus 100. And so I got many, uh, you know, many uh, Lambda functions coming in, make right. these incremental updates, but they're doing them on staggered intervals, and they're doing them, you know, on with batched uh, updates at a much lower at rate, a much lower pace than, yeah, than, 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 than the it downloads. It could be current. an order of magnitude or even more. Correct. Lower <laughs> pace. And it could just be. It just has to. It just has to catch up. It just has to cache for a couple seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Just to decrease the key pressure. If I've got, let's say, 10,000 writes a second coming in, I, you know, for some reason that would be the busiest Reddit post in history. But let's say we had 10,000, you know, posts. Coming in a second on on the Reddit thread, uh, mm -hmm. you know that would necessarily that would mean I'd be right charting across ten logical shards to to get that throughput, uh, and that's going to hit me with basically ten lambda functions uh, in order to decrease the key pressure on the post item to you know uh, less than one thousand writes a second. I would only need I would update the counter every you know ten seconds or so, mm -hmm. and I'd be basically grabbing ten thousand worth ten thousand updates and and updating them all in one second. Right, right, and this is this is where you can use um, maximum batch size for lambda, to to essentially increase this time. There's no um, a, a direct way to say I want this lambda function to fire uh, so often. Oh no, no, but, no! But, but it's you, basically what you do is once the lambda mm -hmm. becomes resident in memory, it just has a it has a five second loop, and it just every five seconds it dumps its counter out to the metadata item and zeros itself. Right, right. And lambda stay re resident. I forget how many minutes, three minutes, something like that. Up five to minutes? fifteen. Up I to think, fifteen right? minutes. No, that's okay. Been, yeah. And so you know, as long as that mm -hmm. lambda functions in memory, it's just going to be dumping every five seconds if there's anything in my counters, and then just mm -hmm. clearing the counters and starting over again. So it's a pretty right. simple, very simple process. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. Looking for using lambda to cache the counter. So we just we just went over that. I hope that answers your question, danger thirteen. And um, um, let's see. What strategy do you use for choosing how wide to scatter a given key that is right heavy? Sure, that's uh, another good question. He so says I'm using SQS in this case, not Kinesis. This is event sourced. Okay. Okay. So uh, in this particular case. <coughs> um, 
really what you're going to be looking at is the number of events that are coming in per second, the size of those events, and that's mm -hmm. going to dictate how much throughput you need. And then what I'll do is add some sort of a cushion for future growth. Mm -hmm. Right. So if let's say I'm processing today, you know, it would, it would just pull 10,000 events per second. Right. Then, right, right. And those events are all under one kilobyte. Then I'm going to need 10 shards today. But if I expect this workload to grow, you know, by a factor of 2x over the next five years, then I might increase that, you know, to, you know, 20. Right. Partitions. Uh, the other, other, other. Uh, uh, oftentimes, what we find is that these are not necessarily balanced workloads, right? Some customers are big; they're the whales. Other customers are, are not so big. And this is like if you look at a lot of AWS services, the way AWS services are configured, they have soft limits. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes the soft limits are there because of resource constraints, like infrastructure issues, right? Like if you want more than a million, you know, WCUs on a DynamoDB table, I'm probably going to need to rack some hardware for you. So yeah. we'll have some soft limits on how much you can provision without coming and talking to me. It's right? kind of just a gate, like right. a checkpoint. It's a checkpoint. Yeah. Other times those soft limits are, are for configuration uh, items, right? Like, you know, if we have, uh, you know, customers might need a certain uh, number of configuration items within a given service um, and by default that'll live within a single partition on their DynamoDB table because most of our AWS services use DynamoDB for the right. configuration data uh, but if a customer needs more and some of our enterprise customers might need more right mm -hmm. uh, and then they'll say okay well how many would you how many do you need and they say well mm -hmm. okay we need 10 million configuration items we say okay great yeah. for you Mr. Customer we will add another five logical partitions to support your workload and so when the workflow processes fire for this particular customer, they're gonna read, again, that zero partition like we saw with Cord, right? Mm -hmm. Most yeah, collections, yeah. most collections live in one partition. You know, number of customers that own a given collection is less mm -hmm. than one partition's worth of data. Some things like Lord of the Rings or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know I mean? These are gonna be gonna owned get, by yeah. hundreds of millions of people, right? So now all of a sudden we need to add, yeah. you know, more partitions, right? So, and we use application layer configuration data to dictate whether we're reading one or more. In the case of the mm -hmm. cord service, you saw the zero partition contains a metadata item. In the case of other services, it'll be a top level configuration you know, item for the customer account. Right, right. right. Yeah, exactly. A couple of more questions. Sure. A question how to handle um, query patterns that change after the application is released. The question is from uh, Kay Falk. Do you have any hints for managing complexity of GSI keys when you have a combination of relationship plus filter value plus sure. sort key, it gets exponentially complicated to encode it all in a string and needs sure. many GSIs. Sure. So, um, okay, a couple questions there. Uh, what was the, the first one was, uh, mm -hmm. what was... Do you have any hints for managing complexity of GSI yeah. keys when you have a combination? Or there was something about adding additional access patterns, right? Did you know uh, that? Um, yeah, how to handle query patterns that change after okay. the application so is released. I'll answer that released. one first. So, yeah. so uh, query patterns that change actually after the application is released. So typically what we see, and I see this a lot, is the uh, <clears throat> what we're going to have is new features, right? Mm -hmm. uh, enhancements to existing features. Uh, changing slight tweaks in the access patterns. It's, 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 it's rare that you might see somebody say, oh, yeah, we don't really need that access pattern anymore, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be more like, oh, we need it, but we need to do this instead, or we need it, and right. we, or we need these different patterns. So in this mm -hmm. particular case, what typically ends up happening is as there's usually some sort of ETL involved with the existing data. I might need mm -hmm. to run a process to do a table scan and annotate items of a particular type with additional metadata to, or, right. or tweak the keys in a, in, a, in a way to provide different sorts. Uh, or whatnot. Or if it's time limited data, then you can basically just use that. Or we that can age it a, out, right? Yeah, it exactly. Out. Yeah. Um, or you know, we might be adding new entities into the system. We might add new partitions, and then we might need to find new relationships to these, mm -hmm. you know, partitions. Right. Again, it's it's more of an ETL. It's an enhancement of the existing model it's adding to it and then we might need to create additional indexes mm -hmm. right to support some other you know secondary access right. patterns so changes to the patterns i'm not terribly worried about mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it typically involves tweaks to the model now if you're telling me that you're, the that you're changing the applications you know data model then it, all yeah. bets are off i mean right, if, you're, right. if you're fundamentally if the fundamental access patterns were wrong then we made a mistake it's time to go fire your marketing team right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah okay yeah uh, and then the second question was uh, what was it again it was uh, do you have any hints for managing complexity of GSI keys when you have a combination of relationship plus filter value plus sort key? It okay. gets exponentially complicated. Yeah, yeah. So uh, typically what you're trying, you're going to try and do is use sort key conditions to give you initial slice of the result set, right? So, you know, you know kind of your initial filter. Uh, and then DynamoDB is really neat because it allows you to have any number of additional filter conditions that apply after the sort key condition is read. Mm -hmm. And I use this a lot. So uh, understand that within, within an RCU, 
uh, you're going to get multiple items, uh, you know, that are less than one kilobyte. It all adds up, right? So, you know, it's four kilobytes of data. And if you mm -hmm. have 100 items that make up those four kilobytes, then that's great. It's four mm -hmm. kilobytes. Now, RCU costs you one RCU. If I read, a, if I use my sort key condition, it returns, let's say, 80 items, and those 80 items all make up less than one RCU. And then I apply a filter condition, and it knocks out 75 of those items. Guess how much that read cost me? One RCU. One RCU. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, see? Yeah. And so we'll mm -hmm. use this trick a lot, right? Where it's like my sort key condition is not as selective as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. It brings back a much bigger result set than I want. But I'm going to then apply some filter conditions that are going to knock that result set down to exactly what I want. So this is how we're going to try and craft our queries. And understand that it doesn't always have to be the minimum RCU cost, right? That query might actually right. cost me five RCUs and I return less than one RCUs worth of data, but that's still a pretty efficient query, right, if, right, if, I'm, not, right. if I'm not executing it thousands of times a second. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the other you know, thing is when does a filter condition make sense? Well, it makes sense when uh, the cost of the query with the filter condition is not significantly more than the cost of the query without exactly. it. Uh, and, and it would cost mm -hmm. me more to maintain or it would cost me more to maintain a selective index than right. it would cost me to use the filter condition because the query velocity and frequency is mm -hmm. not that high. Right. right, so it's, these are the trade-offs we're making in NoSQL. Right, when do I use filter conditions versus selective sort key? When do I, you know, or, or, or create a selective GSI? Right. right, these are the things that we're going to be analyzing about our application and understanding about our access patterns. That's why we have to understand our access patterns in detail. Right. Yeah. I saw one question that, that I want to um, bring up. Actually, there's a c couple of questions from this user, um, TJAGX. The first one is. What are the main differences between Mongo and Dynamo? And and I will just say MongoDB and DynamoDB. <laughs> I, I think it's a, it's a great question. Sure. And then he's asking another question that's sort of related. Is Dynamo suitable for high frequency data? For example, sensor data, or um, is that use case better suited for Redshift? Actually, that's not necessarily so related to the first question. <clears throat> that's okay. anyway. First question, what's the difference between MongoDB and DynamoDB? Uh, for properly modeled data for NoSQL, the answer is nothing. And we just described that. What's the difference between a wide column store and a document store? Right. Uh, from a data modeling perspective, absolutely no difference. Mm -hmm. uh, from a query API perspective, there's a big difference, right? MongoDB has a wide variety of query operators uh, that allow uh, kind of, I guess you'd say, what a lot of people kind of refer to as the missing ad hoc query engine mm -hmm. for NoSQL. Um, and to this, I'll respond that I spent a year or more, a little bit over a year at MongoDB, and uh, I spent a lot of time unwinding a lot of those aggregation framework queries because the problem with those is it's the same problem the relational database has. Mm -hmm. Joining data is expensive. Ad hoc queries are expensive. Right. If you're trying to use the CPU to churn through volumes and volumes of data to produce computed aggregates and result sets and whatnot, then you're going to be burning your system alive, and that's what happens when you run aggregation queries. So It's one of the key obstacles to the ability to scale. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and it's one of the biggest problems MongoDB users have, mm -hmm. when I, especially at scale. When you, when you start to bring the, you know, when, you, when you're running out there with a small workload that's never really pushing the limits of the system, you're never going to notice that, the, that you have these problems. Mm -hmm. When customers scale, <clears throat> typically that's when I get involved because they start to experience problems. And so they're like, well, maybe DynamoDB is the answer. So we'll go talk to them about what they're doing. And on, most of the time, 90% of the time, what I do is I'll muck with their data model, I'll tweak mm -hmm. their things, and we'll get them running. And they don't have to change anything other than how they're accessing their data. And they'll right. stay, they're just fine. They stay on their MongoDB <laughs> cluster. And, you know, they won't ever scale to the point where they start feeling more pain. Yeah. Now, there is a scale point with MongoDB, with Cassandra, with every off-the-shelf NoSQL database that you're going to start feeling scale pain. Mm -hmm. That's when you come talk to me about cloud-native solutions, right? That's when we get into DynamoDB. And, and in fact, I was just going to say that, that, that one other point of difference between those two is the fact that DynamoDB is a cloud-native database. That's correct, yeah. And, and what, what does that even mean? Well, sure, I can run MongoDB in the cloud as well. I can, I can run any of these databases right. in the cloud. But the difference is DynamoDB was designed to run in a cloud and provides abstractions that, that you use to, to essentially make the whole thing easier. Yeah, right? it's a fully multi-tenant database. It's a right? fully so multi-tenant database. It's not designed to be deployed on-prem. It won't. It was never You, you know, don't deal with servers. Be, right? Exactly. And that's the other thing. You don't deal with servers. And, and I say this because it is a one sort of difference that, that we see people struggling with a little bit because they're used to dealing with their clusters and nodes in the cluster and servers. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, if you really think about it, your capacity planning becomes much easier if you don't have to figure out what is the amount of uh, 
scale I get from a single server, yeah. right? For your capacity planning, you, you just need to know the data volume and then reads and writes, yeah. basically. And, and well, you don't want to, with, with, with every single legacy NoSQL technology out there, you're going to have to provision for peak and leave it there. And leave it and there. And you're never going right. to be able to take that capacity away. With DynamoDB, you get just-in-time provisioning, you get auto-scaling, it can go up, it can go down. And, and elastic scaling. And elastic scaling. Incremental. Right? And you right? only pay for, and this is the difference between cloud-native and legacy, right? right. The, the, the legacy technologies, the MongoDB, Cassandra, I mean, you got to think about it, guys. These things were built, for, you know, 10, 15 years ago and they were designed to be deployed on-prem mm -hmm. in on-prem data centers they are pre-cloud technologies right they do not scale the same way as a as a as a dynamo db or any other cloud native database right. for that for that and, and, and in fact i said you need to know your your reads and writes kind of in, in fact with with dynamo db now you don't even need to know um, in a lot of cases, what, what yeah. the amount of reads Depending and on the nature of your workload, if right. you have a spiky, spurious workload where when it comes, it, it hits me at 100 miles an hour, but I, when, but mm -hmm. I don't know when it's coming. Right. And, it, and it doesn't come all the time. It comes the, then on demand. On demand on is a demand, beautiful exactly. technology for this, right? right. Yeah. So anyways. So, so one, one question from the same user um, was about um, when to use um, Redshift versus... So TJGAX, is Dynamo suitable for high frequency data sensor data or is that better suited yeah uh, no absolutely so no i mean redshift i mean that's a data warehousing solution it's great it scales to mm -hmm. you know a petabyte scale <laughs> Uh, DynamoDB is certainly suitable for your high frequency sensor data. And again, depends on the access pattern, right? So uh, Redshift is going to provide dimensional ad hoc queries, right? You're going to get a dimensional snow, uh, stars or snowflake schema where you're going to be able to run some, you know, uh, level of ad hoc queries. Uh, DynamoDB is not going to support those types of ad hoc queries. If you have an OLTP workload running against your sensor data, absolutely. And we have mm -hmm. IoT workloads that use DynamoDB that are scaling beyond anything I've ever seen from any right. other NoSQL database. Uh, literally, right. I think I, I've last I heard our fastest table is going is over seven million transactions per yeah. second. Yeah, a lot of times it's not either even a question of either or because a oh, lot that's of true times too. you that's need true. both. That's right? right. That's true. The decision support systems and the workloads that run against those are different than the workloads that run against your know, NoSQL database. I might need that right. sensor data online for my OLTP workloads. Mm -hmm. I might need it in a factory where it can be queried more ad hoc. In right, the right, support exactly. System. So, so for your essentially real time mm -hmm. needs, OLTP. Right, uh, decision support views. You'd be using DynamoDB, but then you 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 use Redshift for your analytics. Um, That's right, and and possibly use DynamoDB streams to essentially stream data to from Dynamo to or, or 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 copy table or right. you know data pipeline or a variety of other technologies as well. Right. So we're running up on the end of the hour here. That's so right. I think we're gonna have to wrap it up. Thanks a lot for all the questions, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, Eden. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Man, that was good. That was good. Yeah.